One, two, three, four. No. Yes. One, two, three, four. Yeah, are we on? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Looks no, nice. Stop there. Five, do you want to stand up? <laughs> if, you, if you're coming in. Okay. Sit down, big boy. <laughs> Hello. This is Pug Beast. I'm called Margaret Barnes. I'm a nutritional therapist and now I also work in canine nutrition. Pugster is the reason for this in the main. I worked as a music teacher for my day job paying the bills. And alongside that in my spare time I worked in a holistic healing business for my own health condition and for my own interest really. And as it was that I used to pug sit, Pugster in the holidays and he became poorly with mast cell cancer which is like a cancer of the allergy cell and the fact recommended as a last resort he would just have to get put to sleep and there were no other options after he tried chemotherapy and was put on a steroid. After knowing what I'd done and how I'd worked with humans it felt right that we had to give you know Pugster like at least a chance just one last chance to see what we could do considering uh, he was loved by many people on you and um, that's essentially what we did. I was born one in a hundred thousand with a rare blood disorder which meant that my veins bleed into my joints on my left leg so hence my knee sort of fused together leading me to needing a knee replacement. Obviously that I was quite young on the NHS it was very difficult to obtain my surgery and we did surgery and it didn't go as planned and I was very very sick and I used naturopathy and nutritional therapy to get myself back on my feet and I do believe it got me on my feet a lot quicker and I think because I tried it on myself and I think because I was fully immersed I was like I need to do this for other people and because I've got a chronic disease and something that you can't cure inverted commas it's about management and it's about support and uh, herbalism and nutrition are just totally vital to that. I think I'm healthier now than probably than I've ever been. Pugster had mast cell cancer and that means he's got cancer of the allergy cells. He had three tumours, went which up to around 11 after his chemotherapy failed. He went put on the steroids and he had breathing issues and we really thought he was in a lot of pain and the vet probably thought that was the end of the line for him. So he came to me and um, I just, I felt like I had to give him a chance to see all my work that I did with human patients, would it work with a dog? So we started by detoxing his body from the chemotherapy. He was quite ill, he didn't show much response for about a week. He wasn't in any serious pain but just very lethargic and just really lay there. During that time, we wanted to move him away from a kibble diet onto some nutritious foods, you know, to support the body. And that led me on a huge rabbit hole into canine nutrition, using Pugster as my guide, you know. We started feeding him to hell. His tumours, we actually managed to get rid of one. One came up on his neck to around the size of a golf ball. So with topical application and obviously we were sort of moving into that full diet, optimal nutrition at that point, we managed to get rid of that tumour and it's never come back since. The layers of skin, you can see where the tumour was and potentially that scar tissue. The rest of them remain dormant and then probably around every year a tumour will perhaps get a little bit more aggressive than usual and we have to treat it as such. And we're currently in that stage now. And like you say, it looks gory but it's superficial if he's in any pain we can manage that but he hasn't shown any signs of pain i.e that he still walks he still wants to go out he still eats his dinner and he's constantly on the move around the house if he was sat around if he was panting if he was doing lots of licking we might think he's in pain so i guess that um, the tumor is manageable to him so quality of life is amazing for us we see a healthy dog and we, we go to the vet under regular consultations and he's just like keep doing what you're doing he seems to be full of life and i said you know, when's the time to put him down? He said, you'll know. And he, he, he agrees too, that Pugs is living a great life. And so, you know, why stop now? We just have to, it's about management, isn't it? Supporting the body and supporting the tumours.
Some of my favourite parts are actually not that I would wish it on Pugster, but when he was at his lowest, when we were really studying and doing all the research, it was amazing. I opened a whole world, which all linked into music and emotion and to colour and to energetic healing and um, to humans, you know, being able to make those comparisons between a human and a dog were really, really amazing. Although we don't want, we don't want that. <laughs> Guys, tell him. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, fine. So first journeying through Pug Beast, finding out what nutrients dogs and humans actually need. What are the requirements? What nutrients are they and how much of them? Then how do dogs absorb them? From what foods are those nutrients found in? And how do you get the most out of those foods to, <laughs> to absorb those nutrients? Um, so that was a huge one. In terms of dogs specifically, looking at dog foods, what is in their food, how is it manufactured, what's the quality, how poor dog food control is, and actually how much branding and marketing there is out there. There are lots and lots of people saying they've got the dog diets, but actually if you were to put them into a nutrient calculator and you check them out, which I do in my research, you find that often they say they're complete and they're not. It's false advertising and marketing. And I think there are just so many rabbit holes and there's so much information out there. And sadly, a lot of it is misinformation. drew me to yourself and coming out and interview yourself because it was just as important if not more important from what I got from your website was the results but it was just as much as that was the science behind it and how you got to those results and that it's not just I know best I've, I've tested it myself and it works it's the you know a, a, a true scientist is constantly trying to prove they are wrong, you know, trying to make sure that, uh, yeah, you know, I make, think make sure so. that the thing they've said is, is actually I, that's correct by trying to make it fail. It's true. There's like almost like a level of arrogance, you know, that you've gone, that I think people sometimes presume, oh, you're the best or this or that. No, not at all. Research is really important for me. And I think what worries me is even sticking something really simple on my website that's taken wrongly. And why I'm always like education, education, education. It took me a long time to find those statistics and the nutrients that I needed for Pugster. And I was a researcher. I had the time to do that. It was, um, oh yeah, I was blessed to have that time. And I think there is so much false information on the internet. And I think people that know a little bit are very stuck in their ways. We have to admit that like canine nutrition is such a new subject. We're only really starting to care. And although there are studies from way back when, from the 60s, from the 70s, we still don't know enough. And so even my like my findings and my sort of concept that I've come up with, that's open to change. And if I said I knew everything, we, we'd be lying because we're just not at that stage yet. And so I think people get very bogged down in how and what type of food to feed. But it isn't really about that. It is really about understanding the nutrients. I make it really clear that we need to work with the vet. We're a complement to the vet. We're not an alternative. The vet's got the dog's safety in mind, the health, pain, relief, all of those things. We're literally supporting the body and making it stronger. So a really good rapport with the vet and with the owner is vital. And then I think vets aren't nutritionists. And I think vets are coming round now to the importance of nutrition. And so I think there's that kind of building bridges almost. I've got lots of patients that will go and see the vet and the vet's like, wow, you know, you're doing something right. I didn't expect that. I think we really like to separate allopathic medicine, this is the way, very regulated, and nutrition. There's a place for both, and they are indeed a complement. Welcome to the canine nutrition class. Today we're going to be making a healthy, nutritious dinner for, um, for canines. And today, because we've got four pugs, we're going to be making a pug-sized dinner. So today we're using um, quinoa, which is a pseudo grain. You could also use buckwheat or brown rice, as it's a good source of fiber and it contains healthy B vitamins. We also need to have some organ meat in there. In this case, we've got beef liver and beef heart. 
The heart to support heart health and liver is a healthy source of vitamin A. We then move to our meat. We've got some beef mince, good source of zinc. Uh, chicken for poultry oils and some tripe to support the gut. We also, uh, for healthy omega-3 oils, which reduce inflammation, we've got, in this case, salmon and sprats. However, you can also use any other types of oily fish. We then have antioxidants. Antioxidants mop up toxicity in the body, and it's the different colours that display the different types of antioxidants. So today we're going to be using cauliflower, broccoli and carrots. We then include a little bit of seafood, not a lot because it's high in sodium, but it's also a good, um, good source of selenium. So we have prawns and mussels today. And the other things we might have, so we've got organic seaweed to support the thyroid gland, apple cider vinegar, good source of potassium, and a little bit of flaxseed oil, which is um, a vegetable form of omega-3. And then we also have pumpkin seeds, flax seeds, which we will crush, and we'll add a little bit of the powder to the dinner and um, a little sprinkling of seaweed, which supports the thyroid gland. Okay. How much you've made here? How many, how many dinners or how many dogs you've okay. feeding? So um, this is probably like a bigger sized pug um like around 10 to 12 kilo um smaller dogs it would do half a day but ideally really what you want to do is feed two to three percent of the body weight and you can come onto our website and it gives you the exact amount of food in grams and we also break it down in terms of teaspoons uh this is just sort of um off the hat example really of the foods that you use and roughly the size so of course it will be different for every dog and you can find out more on our website as we said Clients find their own way of making those diets. So we give them a recipe and some people batch cook, which is really easy. It takes a while to do the batch cook, but then you can store them in the freezer. You put them in the fridge overnight to defrost. And it's the same as opening a packet of food and placing it in the bowl. For people that don't want to batch cook, I don't particularly enjoy batch cooking. I've got to admit it's a long process. I'll cook every day, but it doesn't take long. You can even put it in a slow cooker. Some of my clients do that. So in terms of cost, you know, you can pick up bargains at the supermarkets where you can. You can go to local farms, etc., and keep the prices down. So really, it's a case of a little research, time management, and obviously choosing a way to cook. There are lots of ways around and ways of creating a healthier diet. And even if your dog is on kibble or a commercial diet, you can make that healthier by adding wholesome, more wholesome foods to that. Whatever diet you're on, you can make it better. Look at how to make it better rather than changing a diet. Don't change the diet unless you've had advice or you've really thoroughly researched the subject, which is hard to do. So again, the best thing to be would be see a canine nutritionist or someone that's well up in their nutrients and balance. So make slow changes and add things to the diet rather than making big changes all at once. So for example, if you're feeding kibble, start adding a little bit of fish a little bit of meat, a little bit of organ meat to the actual dinner. If you're already feeding a natural diet, research your foods, get to know the nutrients in those foods and try to broaden the amount and variety of food and always rotate as well. You've got the best chance of getting all the nutrients you need when you rotate and use variety. The NRC standards are quite complicated and there are numerous books that are a good starting point, including Dog Food Logic by Linda P. Case and Canine and Feline Nutrition by Daristotle, Hayek and Rash. And both, both are good. Um, dog Food Logic is brilliant for if you're feeding kibble or you're feeding dog food and you're wanting to sort of understand food labels and quality of food and where do you go. Canine and Feline Nutrition, a little more advanced. It tells you about the nutrients you need and how to calculate. So really sort of they're two good books and I think it's because it's moving away from do you feed a raw diet, do you cook, do I feed commercial food, it isn't really about that. Empower yourself, learn about nutrients and learn about the needs of those nutrients.
dogs are a healer's dog and they take on pain you know they do and i think they're empathic they're so friendly and actually Pugster is perhaps one in a million in that he will do his own thing or go traveling he's completely reliable and just such a good boy he's a pleasure to look after that's our old pugs really just so delicate and empathic yeah and fun though really fun aren't you <laughs> Probably the best I've done it and keep while he's barking. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, boy. oh my god. Right, okay. So I'm gonna go and get down and make sure we use keep boy. We're just gonna do that again, yeah. Okay, all right, he's staying on mode then. Yeah, I don't think she should be that's perfect. Does that work? <laughs> yeah. Stay there. That's good. Stay there. Okay. 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 So, let's start with the obvious question. Okay. Why am I back? Okay, you are back because um, we lost Pugster in November 2020 after living five years of extra life. When you guys came to video, Pugster had just developed a tumour that had come up and um, he would scratch it and it would bleed. We tried many different formulas and normally we would get them down. Um, it didn't and so for about eight weeks the tumour was like bleeding on and off and it was coming as soon as we get it down it would just come back up and then the tumour came up in his neck. It went really big and it just faded and got weaker within a week. So he was still in the park literally the day before he passed away. He just faded, he just got weaker and weaker but um, still in good spirits right to the end really. I shudder at the thought of the vet just putting him down because he's missed out on so much and why? You know, we had to try. And then I think, could people say, you know, that it was cool to keep him going? In those first few weeks, right, but chemotherapy isn't nice as side effects. And those first few weeks and the weeks at the end were the only time he was ever in, if anything, any pain. So I think that there was no intervention. He wasn't separated from us. He wasn't in the vet. He wasn't put under any pain. He was all at home, he was always with the gang. So for me, that was the right choice. Of course, everyone is different, but I do think that if you noticed his love of life, I would have been really sad to have known that I didn't try. You know? I think all life is precious and it should always be protected wherever you can. I think then it's a balance against the level of pain and the level of enjoyment in life, isn't it? And I think that's a personal choice and where those boundaries are. However, for me, it's so important to protect life, not to protect it overly, you know, when Pugster got sick this time, it wasn't like I went out. I did what I normally do, but I didn't at the end try and keep saving him to see. You know, you could tell his body was getting weaker. And then he's done five years of extra life that he couldn't. So do you continue to go and then maybe put him through pain at this point when his body is so weak, not knowing really if you have got a chance of getting him back? I think before when we knew what we did and he responded well and his body was strong, and that's when you take the chance, you know, did you keep going? I think, no, it's unfair then. You stop and you did five years and we were really proud of that. And so I think you have to draw the line somewhere and you have to know when to stop and when to heal life. But um, I think it needs to be balanced up against the options. You know? I'd hope that um, the world of canine nutrition becomes a thing and that people see it equally as valid to the vets. 
I'd really like it if vets would work alongside. I mean, let's be fair, many, many conditions are nutritionally responsive. So there's going to be the times when we need the vet, and then there's going to be times when getting the diet right is just so vital and will actually save the need for excessive pharmaceutical use or excessive pain or excessive vet trip. So both to work together as a complement, I think, would be the best outcome. Now that people are starting to advertise, it's almost like, right, take this supplement and eat this diet and get rid of cancer. I don't think it works like that. And I think it's really important for owners not to just go choosing supplements on a whim because we're in such a new paradigm and there are, it's open to such, I guess, corruption really and commercialism, just like everything else. It's vital that owners are going to um, critique and do their research. How canine nutrition develops and the whole ethos behind it will really be driven by the consumer and so vital to get that research and to find and work with the right people. We've got quite a few success stories, not just Pug Beast and my customer client base will always support me and they always come back. That feels really lovely and really amazing to know that people go, gosh Mark, you know your stuff, uh, thank you so much for your help and even in the cases where we haven't had perhaps the greatest success story is something like five years. I think people are like, gosh it did work. Every single person that has come into my clinic does feel that it's effective in some ways and then actually says can you fix the human so then we we move on then from the dog to the human which is amazing as well so really lovely customers are my business i'm proud of it not because of what we do just um, really lovely work you know really okay yeah okay